Welcome to the Future of Sharing, a new series where we're looking hard at the question, how can we make the sharing economy work for everyone? I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent. And today we have a conversation with Yohai Benkler, who is the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard. He's also the co-director of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And he's also been an early theorist, pioneer, thinker in the space that eventually is kind of rolled into the topic we're talking about today, uh, the sharing economy. Great to have you here. Great from a distance. <laughs> he's coming in from uh, the East Coast here, uh, virtually with us. Now, you were one of the early, kind of credited one of the early people really thinking, a visionary of the, of the sharing economy. You, you had this 2004 article on sharing nicely. Uh, in which you were really talking about the potential, uh, the full potential of, of what, what I guess a part of it has now become the sharing economy. Uh, and so when I really just kind of give a little context to this conversation also to your background, when you were thinking about it then, what were you thinking about? And I'm just curious how you think, looking back on it, uh, how is it measured up to the kind of benchmarks that you had projected and the th thinking about the, uh, that potential that was possibly going to unfold? So. What I was doing in the early 2000s was looking at how networks allow us to collect different kinds of um, um, resources in uh, social sharing networks. So in 2002, I wrote a piece on uh, peer production, essentially on collaborative work, on what later on people were talking about with regard to crowdsourcing, um, uh, peer production, uh, collaborative uh, innovation, collaborative science. And a year or two later, I talked about how we had out there in society a whole bunch of what I defined there as shareable goods, basically things that are out there in the world that we put in service as individuals or as households, but that come in lumps that are too big for just one person to use for one thing and too small to become a commercial business or a piece of capital like a big steam engine. Uh, apartments and cars were the most obvious uh, examples. And so the major study there was about carpooling and how essentially carpooling at the time was the second most widely used mode of commuting to work. But there was no economic theory for why people would do it socially as opposed to just have these sort of um, um, essentially privately run van lines. Um, and so this was very much of an economic study of why transactions costs meant that there was an enormous amount of underused capital in the economy, both physical capital and human capital, and how networks of social sharing were freeing up the possibility of uh, load balancing and moving these two seats who were going anyway in this direction to put people in those seats or this bathroom or this bedroom uh, over to other people. As it turned out, um, um, uh, I focused particularly on carpooling, on uh, wireless network sharing, on uh, distributed storage, uh, things like that. Some of them really turned out to be central some of them uh, didn't. Um, but I was also very much focused on why social transactional networks, that is to say actual sharing, not selling stuff, was the first place we would see this because selling needed a much more complex transactional platform that, would, that created a lot of transaction costs by comparison, whereas social sharing was something that we managed through our social relations. And so, in fact, the first generation that we saw was more couch surfing and less Airbnb. Uh, the first set of things we saw were people sharing rides on commutes through Craigslist and, and extending carpooling, and only later on, Uber. So that was the foundation. The foundation was that networks lower the transaction costs of taking resources that are underutilized and balancing the load so that some people could do more and some people could now, you, you also, and I don't know, um, have talked about there was a shift from essentially these network tools uh, related to knowledge or information shifting to service. Is that part of that same fundamental shift that you were starting 
to see the same tools that once could just share blog posts or, 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 or meet pieces of media are now sharing physical things out there. Talk a little bit about that. So the critical thing that changed in the last five years is that the set of things people were doing, the set of things people were sharing, moved from being primarily information, knowledge, and culture, shared primarily in social networks of informal social exchange, to models where people were making money. Some of it was still human capital, other of it was services, uh, like driving someone on Uber or TaskRabbit, and some of it was sharing material resources like Airbnb. And so the critical shift there was that the economic or market transactional frameworks uh, caught up with the human and social sharing networks. And when they came in, they uh, uh, opened up the, the possibility for things that were more about sharing labor and much more traditionally intersecting with traditional markets like service markets and much less focused on things that were purely knowledge, information, and culture. Knowledge, information, and culture are different because they're public goods. So we still have free and open source software developed about half more or less on social sharing model and about half on commercial model but occupying massive parts of our software infrastructure. We still have Wikipedia as a major, major source of information and knowledge that's purely social. We have citizen science projects like Zooniverse, where when you're talking about science, when you're talking about knowledge, when you're talking about culture and fan culture, these are all things where the basic resources are um, public goods, existing information, knowledge, and culture, where the basic labor input is intellectual labor that is very much uh, similar to sitting and talking with friends. And so when you have something that is intrinsically social together with a public good that's information, you really can get a very powerful and sustainable contained economy from start to finish that is purely outside of the market. Once you start to move to things like how am I going to do my laundry? Uh, how am I going to uh, mow my lawn? Uh, how am I going to get from point A to point B? You start to compete with a service market that's using scarce resources, either labor or a bedroom. And that's when you start, that's, that came in later because the transactional platform, the commercial transactional platforms didn't catch up to the social platform and still until the late end of the first decade of the 21st century. And once it came in, it slowly began to occupy the field and sometimes compete head to head. So you have Airbnb essentially out competing completely couch um, uh, So the social model gets displaced by the market model. And the market model has its own uh, complications. Right? When you talk about Wikipedia, it's simply a mistake to think of it as free labor that's being exploited by some. It's an act of love by thousands of people creating something for millions of people. It's not exploitation. It's very different when you're talking about an Uber driver. And the whole set of concerns about exploitation, about the tension between what's best for consumers in terms of prices and availability and what's best for workers in terms of uh, their own flexibility and autonomy, and income. That's a tension that comes in once you move it from being a social knowledge production project to making it a service provision. Now, now when you say that evolution, would you say that was basically inevitable at some level? I mean, once you kind of set in motion uh, and proved it essentially with these, these kind of new network tools in this knowledge information economy that inevitably it was going to start to move into other spaces, including service. Uh, I mean, you see that as just a natural evolution, and if so, were these companies playing a kind of critical point, a place in, in, in essentially solving a complex problem of like, how do you make financial transactions, you know, consistently and clearly and um, easily and all the other things about hooking up these peers, essentially, who are either giving their labor or giving their, 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 their 
rooms or whatever it is and, and offering it to that market. I'm just kind of curious how you see that or do you see it as some aberration that was, was kind of moved off the rails a little bit by, by these more commercial in interests? Um, I'm somewhere between those. Uh, in other <laughs> words, okay, well, tell me. I generally don't believe in, in inevitability in technology, period. Uh, I think technology has certain characteristics that engross uh, uh, influence what's feasible and what's not feasible. And then there's a lot of variation internally about things we care about enormously about how it gets deployed. So do I think that network technologies lowered transaction costs of people knowing about who knows what, where, who has what, where, who has more time or less time than somebody else um, so that you no longer needed a clear firm with lines of authority and clear property rights in order to make everything work? Absolutely. I do think that network technologies uh, in some sense force the emergence of a much more fluid boundary to the traditional firm, who's inside the firm as an employee or outside, what's inside the firm as an asset, what's outside. That came under enormous pressure from the fact that you have a ubiquitously networked economy. Um, do I think that it would have been possible to develop a much more uh, successful social sharing model that would have then excluded the emergence of a commercial market? Uh, probably. Um, it didn't happen in most services. Um, it did happen in some domains of knowledge production but not in others. I think when you look at Wikipedia, there's no question that it came in early and it preempted the field of encyclopedic writing uh, in a way that uh, made it very hard for any commercial competitor uh, to come in. Um, I do think that when you have a commercial company that's very focused on allowing people to have transactions, that allows people to um, lower the emotional load that's necessary in social exchange, and just use money, uh, you get benefit. One of the things I'd say that I understated, uh, what is it now, 12, 13, 14 years ago, was that social transactional networks also have their burden, that it takes time to be a decent sharer and it takes emotional load. And sometimes it's just easier to pay depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and the flip side is that the lowering transaction costs, even if it took five, 10 years, or seven years, um, lowering transaction costs also happens on the side of the market. So the basic economics are the same. The leaning in towards social would only have happened uh, had we really seen takeoff of social sharing networks um, uh, that would have preempted certain fields. So the basic point is, it's not that it was inevitable to go one way or the other. The commercial firms have a certain advantage in terms of their ability to raise money, in terms of their ability to sustain effort in a very clear way, in terms of their ability to let people just pay conveniently and not have the emotional. The social sharing has the combination of the social emotions, building actual relations, um, and uh, being relatively flat and non hierarchical um, what we've seen, for example, with cooperatives, not online, just in the real world, is when co-ops establish in a region or in a sector, they more or less occupy it. And then firms uh, find it harder, firms that are traditional investor-owned firms find it harder to come in. When investor-owned firms occupy a field, it's harder for co-ops to settle. But neither is so clearly more efficient than the other that it drives the other out of the market. And I think that's essentially the dynamic we saw with social production, where it was established early, where it became the habit. If people had had the habit and the app early on to just know that they could look and there'd be 70 people going more or less two blocks from where they were and it would be fun and people would sit around in the car and chat for 20 minutes. And that would have existed before Uber came in. The demand for Uber was highly saturated. Once you've gone, a fully integrated uh, uh, commercial product like Uber, it starts to be much harder 
to integrate this more fluid, less certain, uh, less reliable, but nonetheless more social model to occupy the same niche. And I think that's what happened. It was staging and who came in when at what context. Mm -hmm. so, so we had this explosion of um, activity and other people also kind of dated, you mentioned the late 2000s, you know, people talk about the 2008 crash and kind of since that period and a lot of these companies kind of track from that period on. Um, you've made distinctions uh, before a little bit between what people commonly call the sharing economy now and the on-demand economy. And, and I just, um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? So, so have we evolved yet again into another sector of the sharing economy is really more a different kind of economy, which is on-demand, which is different than the sharing piece? Or, or, or how do you think about that? And how would you explain that to someone who's trying to wrap their head around this? So I think, the critically important thing is to distinguish between our threat models and our benefit models. Market relations have certain advantages and certain disadvantages. They're, they have relatively well understood problems in terms of externalities, companies that try to uh, make profit at the expense of whatever it is, if it's the environment, if it's the workers, if it's the community, if it's dodging regulations, at the same time, trying to make money, having the, uh, having the profit motive, um, uh, having the investment money to actually build better platforms. So they have their own costs and benefits. Social relations have their own costs and benefits. The kind of domination you get in a society with some people trying to be, uh, follow the leader and everybody has to do and I want the status versus something else. It doesn't mean social relations are all good and market relations are all bad or vice versa. Each one presents its own problems. I think sharing uh, as a moniker uh, should primarily be reserved for talking about those practices that are primarily social. Because that's what we think about when we think about sharing. Yes, in principle, we say let's share a cap from the consumer side. Uh, but fundamentally, if, if you're thinking, for example, as a, as a municipal regulator, as, as a municipal authority, um, the kinds of things you have to worry about from a company like Uber or Airbnb in terms of <clears throat> overloading the system because you're trying to scale, you're trying to increase profits in terms of protecting workers, in terms of um, uh, getting the right kind of insurance are different from concerns you have with informal sharing that's being scaled up because of network uh, uh, effects. And so that's what I, that I think on-demand economy uh, captures the idea that what you're getting is reliable services from unreliable parts, as, as Clay Shirky uh, uh, referred to it. Um, you've got all of these workers who are part-time workers going all over the place. And just like the internet itself is a reliable system from unreliable parts, so too you can get a reliable service Uber from unreliable parts, the individuals who aren't committed to being there from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and that's one class of advantages and disadvantages. And then another is the situation where you have something like couch surfing, uh, where essentially you're, you're, you've got unreliable uh, 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 components, of reliable uh, uh, service, more or less, but it has a different set or it has a different scale. It has a different social relationship. The background of the social uh, uh, sharing is different. The motivations are different. The kinds of things you have to worry about are different. Um, and I think mostly cities have been bumping up against on-demand economy pressures rather than social sharing. And that I think has to do with the scale, the speed and the drive of profit money. What about, would, would you, because other people have talked to us about this distinction, is there a distinction between maybe more like capital oriented sharing economy companies and, uh, and, and labor oriented uh, sharing economy companies? So, so for example, taking those examples you just mentioned, Airbnb, you know, you, you have this capital, you have this house, you have this spare room. When that gets tied into the sharing economy, it's not really a labor issue. You know, maybe there's a little cleanup after before, but it's really you're sharing a capital expense that you've invested in or something like that. 
Whereas if you're essentially TaskRabbit or Etsy or something, you're essentially then more about, it's, it's really more about labor. And weirdly, Uber and Lyft are kind of in the middle in that you're, they're using their car in excess capacity, but they're also giving their labor. I'm just curious, do you think in that kind of term, capital I labor? Think that, that is exactly right. I think that's exactly right. When I wrote Sharing Nicely, uh, it was precisely about sharing shareable goods, about shareable, uh, um, about sharing of uh, material capital. Uh, like Airbnb, and if it were car sharing or if it were tool sharing, that would be the, the, the primary example. Uh, labor sharing is much more an extension of peer production and, and, and uh, what I talked about a couple of years earlier with regard to collaborative work uh, and collaborative labor. And so absolutely those two are quite distinct. Um, the other thing I think we need to sort of pause for a moment and realize is that even though three years ago, when we said the Uber of everything, we could imagine that become. But that was three years ago. You look at it today in late 2016, it's not as though there are seven other Airbnbs for something else and 20 other uh, uh, Ubers for other forms of labor. Really, what you've seen are um, uh, is Airbnb, and land has always been a quite distinct form of capital with a very complicated relationship to commodification, that is to say, to becoming a market. One of, of, of Polanyi's classic frictional commodities is land. Uh, and that's really a very, very fixed uh, quantity. And we have an extremely inefficient system of sharing it. So Airbnb in this regard, you're absolutely right, doesn't raise the labor problems, raises only the potential externalities uh, to neighbors and the potential impact perhaps on the hotel industry. Uh, but fundamentally what you have is uh, uh, millions of, of uh, square uh, feet out there that could be used and aren't being used and now are be being brought online. And really it's the relationship between the owners and the renters. And as you say, to some extent, between the services. So you can have the implications that you have there have more to do with the kind of dynamics you saw with gentrification, with availability for low income rent, uh, with, with noise uh, potentially uh, for neighbors. These are much more about land use regulation than they are about labor. And, and the trade-offs are very different. Um, we haven't actually, even though people were rolling out ideas about tool sharing, we actually haven't seen a major emergence of people sharing their, their, their hammers uh, and power tools uh, through either social or commercial platforms. It exists, the idea has been out there for a while, but it hasn't really become a major market. It's really in many senses constrained to Airbnb. And we also haven't seen carpooling social carpooling explode along these lines, which would also be. Then if you look at labor, again, Uber, and to some extent Lyft, but Uber in particular has been enormously successful. Um, but we haven't seen the Uberification of everything as people were talking about three years ago. We've seen an industry that is already highly exploitative of workers, already primarily composed of independent contractors, uh, many of them immigrants, um, using, uh, uh, entering successfully into an uncertain employment situation and providing an uncertain employment opportunity for people who are doing part-time work, successfully scaling, where there are enormous rents to be had by dissipating the rents of the medallion system. We haven't, in fact, seen uh, major uh, uh, developments elsewhere. We have seen in some parts of um, um, higher skilled work, sort of uh, software development. We've seen online marketplaces develop where once you might have had only peer production or only free software or only more direct contracting. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, we do see that, uh, but we don't actually see uh, uh, 
task rabbit hasn't exploded in the way that Uber did. Uh, Handy uh, and, and house cleaning uh, haven't developed in the same way uh, that Uber did. So, well, what, what, uh, so it's still a question. Well, what, what, what do you make of that? Why, why hasn't it? And given everybody's kind of or people who knew what's going on, uh, predictions around those sites. Is, is it just taking longer potentially to absorb? It's a, it's a different model that's meeting resistance or uh, any thoughts on why isn't that happening? So, so first of all, it's important to recognize that it hasn't taken off in the same way uh, so that we can calm down the expectations and the sense that this is the next of everything. It may end up being the next of two or three sectors, which is a big deal for the companies in those sectors, but it's not the next of everything. So that's the first. The second point is, um, it may well be that the, we're misunderstanding the richness of the relationship associated with different kinds of services, so that we are assuming that everything can be broken up into small, uniform chunks where it doesn't matter particularly who the individual is or where they are. Uh, and it may well be that taxi and limousine service is actually a quite distinct service where the thing you need to chunk, just like with sharing uh, shareable goods, you need to chunk specific pieces, these four seats going from here to there, that bedroom staying on this particular night. It's very standardized, it's very chunky, and you can just identify the chunk and hand it over. It may not be the case, as it turns out, that cleaning services are like that. I'm almost certain, I'd say I'm more than almost certain, I'm certain that home health care is not like that. Uh, the idea that all services are the same, that they are sufficiently discrete chunks of sufficiently homogeneous nature, that it doesn't matter who the particular individual is who's doing it, but their particular relationship to the client is. Um, um, if that's not true, then it's much harder to build a service that runs on the model of uh, reliable services from unreliable parts. Because what you need is a reliability, trust, and personal relationship with the park, not with the system. Wow. So it turns out, for example, that cleaning services you actually want somebody who knows your house. You actually have your own particular way of doing things. Uh, then you're losing some quality when you're moving to this. No question this is true with home health care, which is another industry where people. So that to me is the big question. Are services all like that or not? And I'm not at all confident that all services are the equivalent of taxi and limousine service in terms of the neatness and discreteness of the chunks in which they get consumed. That's a fascinating insight. It's interesting. It's also interesting coming here. We're in San Francisco here, where we're our base here, and um, we're having tons of conversations about, you know, AI and robotics. And weirdly, there's a similar kind of related conversation going on or what are tasks that are really humans great at and you need that kind of subtle nuance complex touch and what are kind of more essentially fungible uh chunkable or however you, you oh. kind of talk about it that a machine could just you know who cares it's just a machine boom 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 so it's a kind of funny uh, or not funny but it's an interesting kind of analogy because what we're trying to figuring out now is is where is that line you know between these uh things and i think what you're pointing out which i hadn't really thought about as much is that line must might be uh much more defined in in this the potential disruption to services than than a lot of people are worried about. Is that, would that be fair to that's, say what you're saying? I think that's plausible. I'm also deeply skeptical about the robot story. I as, don't long as, I, as long as I brought it, as long as I brought it up, because mention because you know, people talk about Uber being just, you know, temporarily holding place for the drivers while, you know, the, the automated cars come or something. But say why you're, so why you're so skeptical. So, so automated cars are a, a, a genuine concern for work in, the commercial driving industry. I think that's plausible on the 10 to 20 year horizon for sure. Uh, my skepticism comes from the fact that I don't actually buy that work comes in tasks. There's a whole literature on skills bias technical change that 
suggests that the patterns of inequality we've seen are a function of the fact that people with high skills are getting paid more, people with lower skills are getting paid less. The tasks framework was very much developed to explain why people in routine tasks are getting replaced by automation. One of the reasons I don't buy that is what, for example, is ground crew in an, air, in, in an area? That sounds like something that's very clear and very routine. And yet, Southwest Airlines, the same exact task description in Southwest Airlines and one of the other major carriers might show up as exactly the same on the national macro statistics. But clearly, Southwest Airlines has succeeded in building a different work relationship such that over decades, they make more money with happier employees than their competitors. So it's simply a mistake to imagine that the quote task of being ground crew is the same. Task is a function of the context of how the organization runs. And for companies where actually the human connection, the initiative, the insight, the everybody constantly trying to do better in every place given the context of other people, those things won't be automated. And as long as you don't understand that work doesn't come in tasks, You'll keep looking for how robots will replace tasks, but that's not how work really comes. Let's just talk to a little bit more, um, some solutions here. You, you did a really incredible uh, video for the World Economic Forum, I guess just about a year ago, 2015, if I recall, on the challenges of the shared economy. Um, and, and I just wanted to kind of get into that a little bit and de deconstruct that a little bit and elaborate on that. Um, it was a quick, short thing, but it, it, it was a very powerfully teed up kind of the challenges. And that's a lot of what this series is, is, is not only understanding what's going on out there, but also starting to rec make recommendations about what, what we can start doing, uh, whether it's within through governments, you mentioned as well, nonprofits and even firms themselves. And so I guess to tee up that conversation on what can be done and what should we be doing and get your, your advice from your vantage point, um, to, to, maybe you could kind of sum up for folks a little bit, what, what, what were you trying to do in that challenges of the shared economy there and that, um, what, what were you, you were teeing up, a, a kind of, actually what was quite fascinating, you mentioned Polanyi a little bit before, you were trying to talk about how, you know, we're in the middle of a very big transformation here potentially and, and a lot of the sorting out that's happening here is, has got big implications. But, but maybe you want to so, explain it. So I think one of the things that's been, uh, and, and my thinking on this has been evolving even over the last year or two quite substantially as I've been thinking more about this. Um, what we've seen in the last 40 years is that um, market structures can lead to very different outcomes in terms of equality and inequality. If you look at the 50s, 60s, 70s, the United States was a capitalist economy and it created relatively wide, widely shared prosperity. Uh, with the very, very large exception of um, uh, African Americans and women, that is to say, for a portion of the population, it was relatively uh, uh, egalitarian. In the last 30, 40 years, it has also been a capitalist economy, but one that was extremely extractive in favor of the 1% and the 0.1%, and with tremendous stagnation for most everybody else. At the same time, a country like Denmark has moved from being egalitarian and less capitalist to more capitalistic, but still very egalitarian. So you actually have a lot of play in the joints of how you organize um, uh, economic production in ways that can be very free enterprise oriented, but at the same time, more egalitarian or less egalitarian. So now come back to the sharing economy. Let's take a scheduling, uh, uh, let's take a scheduling uh, platform. You could imagine taking a very well-designed scheduling platform, having a workforce, all of whom are full-time employees, with all of the benefits, and yet having the flexibility to work for these two hours there, take the kid to school, come back for these two hours later, always be available and on time, but with a completely secure package of employment. Or you could imagine a situation where a company uses the scheduling platform on a zero hour contract basis, where essentially the commitment is only from the worker to the company and not from the company to the worker. 
the technology is exactly the same. The chunks of work are exactly the chunks of work. The critical question is not what can the technology do, but where is the power and where is the social commitment to decide how to use these flexibilities and affordances and where the risk of fluctuating amounts of work lies. Does it lie with the individual worker or does it lie with the firm that absorbs that risk? So the technology gives us the option to build relations of production that can range from extremely uh, um, uh, convenient and, and supportive of the worker uh, with nonetheless producing a stable flow of work for the employer and the investor, or extremely extractive, which may or may not improve shareholder value to some extent. And when I say may not, if you lower worker morale, you may end up actually not increasing productivity in one total, but that doesn't mean it won't be used. Um, um, but the technology is no different. It's exactly the same technology. Now, we know from, for example, the enormous literature on executive compensation that shareholder value and um, 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 incentive theory can lead to extremely bad outcomes, not on the distribution side, on the company value side, right? It's not as though there's always really a tension between uh, equality and, and, and productivity. So if you look at, uh, if you look at, at um, um, CEO compensation, executive compensation generally, in the 80s, there developed a whole theory about how you needed to pay executive in stock and stock options in order to align their invest incentives with the shareholders and improve, uh, uh, um, and improve performance. Over the course of the 90s, that's overwhelmingly what caused the explosion in executive pay. And looking back from 2012, from, from studies in 2012, that accounts for about half of the explosion of the top 1% income, executive compensation, managerial compensation. The problem is that once you actually also look back at the 25 years of performance, it turns out you actually don't see an alignment between executive play, pay and performance. Lucian Bebchuk and, and Jesse Fried had a beautiful book already a decade ago showing that what was much more important was managerial power. That is to say how much power the CEO had over the board, how much power the management team had over the board. And instead what you essentially got were just social, um, were just essentially a social benchmarking approach and a status competition. So. The first generation of management teams in the LBOs in the 80s suddenly got these multi-million dollar packages. This created a new benchmark and boards started to match that benchmark. Then every board started to say, well, our CEO is better. We're going to aim for the 75th percentile. And everybody started to go uh, uh, up. There was a study, a remarkable study a couple of years ago by, by Jensen and Murphy, who were the two people who were most supportive of option-based executive compensation in the late 80s, to basically come back and say 80% of companies manipulate their earnings in order to improve executive uh, compensation. And they do it at about uh, costing maybe half, half the value of the top corporations in the country. So you have this deep tension between what's good for the investors and what's good for the employees versus what's good for a small number of executives. Now, I'm not saying everything is like that, but we, we can't, after an experience of 30 years of seeing that the wrong set of ideas can lead everyone to lose except for a tiny portion of people, in that case, the executive, to assume that the market will just work out or that the, the, the um, technology will just work out. What we have is a possibility for me. Not everything is possible once technology comes in. There is no market for horse and buggy after there's an internal combustion. Technology creates hard limits on the possible. But within those hard limits, there's a very thick band of uh, uh, noise. And within that band, you can be anywhere from the kind of broad-based uh, productivity growth 
from the investor perspective and employee welfare from the employee perspective that you saw in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Or you can have this extremely extractive model where only a tiny portion of people get the income and where both shareholders and uh, uh, workers are worse off, as we saw in the last 30. So that's really what's, what's on the table. What's on the table is not, will we have network enabled sharing of resources? The question is, will we nudge it to create a model that will actually improve productivity and worker welfare? Or will we have a model that a tiny number of winner take all companies and particularly their founders and executives will extract most of the value and most of it will be extracted. That's what's on the table as far as I'm concerned. So, so really, it, it's not an It's really not about the technology. It's not even about necessarily, well, I guess business incentives. But really, we're talking about institutional, political, kind of social constraints and, and shaping that essentially is is uh, really what we're up against now. I mean, it, it, we're coming to the point now that the potential is there. We see the technology. It's it's all happening around us. We got models that are starting to emerge. And we just got to make some decisions and move forward. Is, is that an accurate way to kind of put it? It's accurate and it's accurate always, not only now. Yeah, that is, I guess that's all inequality. Technology doesn't cause inequality. Capitalism doesn't cause inequality. Societies cause inequality. The combination of social norms, the sense of moral connection between what people are doing and how they get shared institutions, law, social norms, and technology, all of these work together to create a certain set of, of practices. Look, robotics density was higher in the uh, automotive industry in Germany and Japan for decades, including now, but it didn't have the impact on, on uh, automotive income because it was embedded in a legal and social structure that required more widely shared uh, income. Um, barcodes, concentrated, uh, 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 Bart Watson has a beautiful paper on how barcodes concentrated uh, retail, but did so completely differently in countries where small businesses and labor are more and more powerful versus places like the US where they ended up squeezing workers because the worker protections weren't there and squeezing local retailers because they weren't politically organized. So how politics, social norms, um, um, organizational practices, and technology mesh has always influenced why it is that in Denmark having a, having a McDonald's job is a good job, and in the US it is. It's never about the technology on its own. True, true, true enough, but they're also, I, I totally get that, and, and a point well taken. But at the same time, I think you know we're watching Brexit, you know, in, in the Europe, you're watching the Trump phenomena here, you're watching Bernie Sanders, you're watching, you know, th there seems to be a kind of, in a broader context, and then even with the sharing economy, there's now these, these kind of issues are starting to rise. It feels like there's something happening here that's, um, uh, that has broader, imp it's more some kind of epical shift or some kind of more uh, broader historical shifting seems to be happening here. Is, is that your sense? That Absolutely. That's something? Absolutely. I think basically, as I see it, we have the period from, it might be from the New Deal, it might be from World War, from the end of World War II until 1973. In the US, in the UK, in France, uh, 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 the glory of 30, um, um, where you have this period that sometimes we call the Treaty of Detroit era, um, um, that of relative of Keynesian economics from the government perspective, relatively uh, extensive uh, regulation of markets, uh, relatively strong unions, production occurring in traditional industries uh, uh, on a large scale with a relatively managed economy with, with a strong commitment to shared prosperity. 1973, collapse of Bretton Woods, uh, uh, the great inflation, uh, together with the rise of, of uh, neoliberalism, uh, monetarism, Friedman monetarism, with on the left, the rise of consumer as opposed to worker politics, the fragmentation of the left, you see essentially the shift toward what we could think of as neoliberal, the neoliberal moment, the Washington consensus moment, 
Um, and that probably brings us to 2008 will be the marker there. That is to say the collapse. Now we're in a new period, uh, 2008 to who knows, the prior two were about 35 years each. And it took a good decade or more to work out what it was. Um, which clearly, at least since Occupy, at least since 2011, uh, uh, we're seeing um, um, a significant return to the idea that economic production needs to be socially embedded, that you can't just rely on a small number of winners to carry the whole economy and just let the market uh, uh, take care of it all, that that has failed dramatically and spectacularly, and that we need a more socially embedded economy, one that is committed to productivity, but also to widely shared prosperity. The fact that today you see uh, Hillary Clinton running on a democratic platform that is probably economically to the left than anything we've seen since the 70s. Whatever Bernie supporters do are or are not uh, 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 willing to accept, certainly Bernie's run uh, had an influence there. The fact that you see Theresa May coming out in her first week and saying, this is about a shared capitalism in response to the skepticism. Uh, so I think Brexit and Trump are a particular kind of xenophobic uh, nationalistic response to the economic pain and rejection of the idea that globalization and neoliberalism will make everybody better off just wait another decade. Um, but that rejection now is, is in tension between those who are focused on nationalistic or xenophobic answers and those who are focused on redistributive or, or creating a more egalitarian economy. Uh, perspective. And that's really the left-right divide of today. But the rejection of this basic um, acceptance, as we saw under Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, of the basic neoliberal framework that deregulation, let the markets take care of it all, improve the uh, incentives and just do a little bit of tinkering and redistribution at the edges, that that was the debate between right and left. Now we have the debate between right and left of how do we make sure that everyone actually gets a fair share? How do we embed economic production in our social values? And the debate is whether the values are nationalistic and ethnocentric or whether the values are uh, uh, economic redistributive within a pluralist frame. That's the debate joined today. But the basic framework of saying you can no longer have economic productivity without making it widely shareable, that I think is gone. That died in 2008. Yeah. So let's drive that down into the, the current context of the sharing economy, because this is an awesome kind of context. And I, I, I frankly share it very closely with what you're saying there. I, I totally, it resonates. What, what is that, where are we then in the kind of decision tree of the sharing economy now that, that kind of reflects that kind of um, new reality, basically, in terms of going forward? Uh, for example, what, 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 what are firms start to be thinking about? What are, what are, what are government people start to be thinking about? And, and, and for, to, to the extent that, say, you know, nonprofits or different organizations can play in this, what's the, what's, what's the next five years here to sorting it out in, in a way that I think tees it up for folks? Does that so I think the basic challenge is how to re-embed this economic production in social commitment, in, in social relations. Um, it takes several forms. In some sense, the easiest to understand is what's uh, now been called uh, um, platform cooperativism that has been uh, put forward by uh, Trevor Schultz, either, uh, um, which is a very interesting movement. Um, uh, trying to basically say the, there's no reason why the workers can't own the platform. So you have a sharing economy or on-demand economy model but instead of having it be investor owned and worker worked, you have it worker owned. So that's one model. You basically eliminate the tension uh, by making them the same. That's less something government can do about and more something that is uh, purely mutualist, purely out there in, in, in um, the, social, the society for people to see. There's a nonprofit model. I think um, uh, I know you had one of the interviews with Palak 
uh, uh, Shah. So, so the National Domestic Workers Alliance effort to build a platform that combines on one hand, setting national standards for what is a decent form of employment, and at the same time, creating an actual platform for domestic workers to be able to register, to be able to compare their uh, uh, pay and conditions, uh, and to be able to clear jobs so that employers know that they are hiring someone at national standard uh, levels, that employers know that what they're getting is somebody who's um, uh, a human being coming to them from this context, understanding that it's a social relationship, not just something where I just come here for the work. Um, that's another important domain for nonprofits that's not so much about ownership as about setting norms socially and creating a platform that is optimized for the relationship between the employer and the employee, not for extracting the value from the employee for the benefit of a customer and an investor. That's another class. There's the class of questions that is very much in the domain of government, and that's the employment law designation. There's a debate, for example, about whether Uber drivers are or aren't employees of Uber. Uh, that's the classic one that's been litigated uh, uh, quite often. Um, and there you have the debate between people who say we need a special third designation and labor law people, so, so um, Kruger and Harris is the classic uh, current working paper suggesting we need a third model. You've got people like my colleague here at Harvard, Ben Sachs, who says, actually, we don't need it. The, the law on employment and uh, uh, the law on employment and um, labor law is such, is flexible enough that for most of the things that are supposedly quandaries, if you ask a labor lawyer, you can make the decision, some of them are gray, you make the decision one way or the other, and you create that responsibility. The critical point from this broader perspective of where we are in the era is that we need to put a thumb on the scales, that if you, the investor owner, are making money off the work of this person who's being paid by this person who's your customer, you owe that person who's working a duty you need to make sure that you absorb some of their risk. And so we make it a little more expensive to be uh, uh, a, an on-demand economy uh, investor, and that's fine. It's fairer to everyone and stabilizes that form of work rather than destabilizes. Um, so that's at the, that's at the labor law, national labor law level. Um, you, see the, uh, the, you see the move to unionization um, um, uh, and, and the move to actually use the fact that people can uh, network to create some power of labor outside the traditional model. So um, uh, coworker.org was another one of the uh, pieces you had uh, for this series. Um, uh, you obviously have uh, Turk Opticon and the development of an effort to allow uh, Turkers on Amazon Mechanical Turk to, to uh, organize. One of the things that's been critical for labor over the years has been the ability to come together and say, you can't just pit us one against the other. You have to deal fairly with the entire community. So there you're beginning to see the beginning of platforms that are not quite like traditional unions, just like SCIU did not have a traditional union but had to innovate once you were talking about um, uh, home uh, workers that were in services uh, in places that were hard to uh, uh, unionize, just like the National Domestic Workers Alliance has to find a way, or the Freelancers Union has to find a way of organizing people who by the very nature of their work are working alone in individual relationships. It's not a trivial question, but certainly technology can help in implementing some of these basic ideas that combine broad social norm setting, broad labor and employment law legislation uh, protection, and platforms for actually allowing people to. So these are the primary domains of both co-ops, um, uh, nonprofits, building platforms, workers organizing rather than owning, uh, on platforms and through 
of nonprofits and labor and employment law um, as well. These are the main areas on the labor side. On the zoning side, on the concern of cities with regard to managing their, their resources, here again, I think the critical thing is not to get uh, starry-eyed about the technology, but to try to see what the actual values are. So if Uber had been coming in to disrupt an industry that was functioning perfectly, that had no corruption, no political capture, uh, no rents, it would be easier to say Uber bad, medallion good. But that's not how it is. Right? We, we know, and, and it's sometimes very hard for cities to change that, but we know that the medallion system is far from perfect in most cities in which it functions. And so the question then is for uh, uh, city officials who just want to protect the is without criticizing what the constraints of the is are, uh, don't have my sympathy. Uh, if it turns out that you have a particularly well-functioning medallion system in your city that really is fair to workers, that really gives consumers mostly what they need most of the time, uh, that really is environmentally friendly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's one thing. Chances are you can improve on it by building a system that protects the customers, makes sure the city gets the data that it needs about traffic patterns so that it can learn uh, optimizes the environmental impact, all of these things together. But for that, you actually need a city that is not itself simply trying to respond to the political pressures of the medallions. Well, what about in, in that case, the cities from the home sharing or the kind of capital sharing side of things? Any thoughts on that in terms of how, how you'd start thinking about that as a city? Um, so I think some of the ideas about uh, limiting the degree to which uh, units can be purely dedicated. So, so, it, so there are a couple of different problems. If the problem is that units that used to be residential and residential are now being bought by people who are trying to convert them into Airbnb, that's a problem. Because if you're trying to have residential communities mixed with commercial communities alongside each other in order to create a vibrant local community, then allowing uh, people to just buy units off the market and turn them into Airbnb apartments is a real problem. So the kinds of constraints that says some number of days, some reasonable number of days a year that you can completely rent out the whole apartment or more days if it's one room solves that problem because then you really basically have a more stable solution. If the problem is traffic, how many people, then uh, uh, you, can, you can try to bring in whether it's noise regulations, whether it's number of occupants regulations, and again, whether it's just number of days regulations that lowers the load. Uh, so I think in that regard, uh, uh, the, the, the point is to define very clearly what are the values that you're trying to protect, and then see what is the minimal regulation reasonable that will, you don't have to kill the phenomenon, you don't have to regulate it to death. You just have to tamp down so that it scales sideways in a way that distributes the effect rather than suddenly taking the city center of the most exciting area and converting every unit into a tourist unit because at the end of the day, how could anybody afford to live uh, near the center of Florence once you can actually rent it out by the night for hundreds of dollars? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. So, um... So basically, what you're, I guess, to kind of sum up in that kind of sharing economy thing is, um, you're, if, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it feels like you're saying, hey, there's a generally a positive direction this is going. There's a lot of potential still in this phenom. There are some issues that are arising, some tensions. Um, there are solvable problems, though, and you know, using these different levers in these different kind of ways, we should, you know, move forward. Is that largely kind of where you're coming from, or any, any? How would you talk about it? Um, I think the sharing economy or on-demand economy moment is embedded in a much, much larger, trans larger transformation of the economy and transformation of the public. I think what happened to on-demand economy is that it emerged 
at exactly the time that suddenly social consciousness shifted from, ooh, markets are cool, let's go build, innovate, create, and no matter what, to, oh my goodness, most everyone are losing their pants and only a few people are making off like bandits. Let's make sure this doesn't happen. Again. So the first thing to do is separate those two things. Out. We do have to find a solution that first and foremost stabilizes on a more inclusive economy. Within that more inclusive economy, we, uh, uh, we can find reasonable ways of harnessing the enormous value of network economics to make things better for individuals, for companies, for investors, for consumers, um, but only once we actually understand that we can't keep thinking about it the way people thought about it in the 90s, where the general idea was, oh, if we just make more money, everybody will be better off. We now know that's not true, and the politics behind understanding that it's not true have made it too explosive to just ignore. Mm -hmm. And so that actually, because I don't want to take you too long here, but this, that's a, maybe a good place here to kind of just wind it up. Uh, it's been a really interesting and long, complicated conversation, but one that I think really, you really clarify what's happening here. So I will just say, my last question to you is, are you generally optimistic about how this is playing out and kind of excited about what's opening up here? Or are you worried and really uh, concerned that this is not, is going to end badly? I'm just, I'm just curious, where do you, where do you come uh, on that kind of period? Uh, I, I, I'm uh, agnostic as to whether things will uh, go well or poorly. I think that things could go very well. I think things could go very poorly. If I had to guess, I'd say some things will go very well and other things will go very poorly. Uh, I think part of our problem is there is no single clear answer for what went wrong when things went wrong and what went right when things went wrong. It's a complicated process. We've constantly made choices that have had unintended consequences, some good, some bad. And the first step of all is to diagnose what we want and where we want. As long as we're willing to continue to commit that whatever we allow to happen in the economy, and by we, I mean we as government, we as citizens, we as individuals in society, we as entrepreneurs, we as academics, we in whoever we are. As long as we continue to commit to embed what we do in social and human relations, we'll probably at the end of the day be able to nudge it in the right direction. Once we start telling ourselves stories about how I don't have to care as long as I solve the incentives problem, as long as I solve the politics, as long as I solve this, that, or the other technological problem, things will go well, then we'll make mistakes. Hmm. Well, that I think is a perfect place to end, particularly as we're kind of on the, on the eve of a kind of a big election here in the United States, which kind of is, is and weirdly is, is teeing up a lot of these issues. So what I really want to do is thank uh, Yokai Benkler, who uh, really laid out in a big picture way, as only you could, um, kind of the big, the stakes at, at hand here, and also the promise of what's the sharing economy. So thank you very much for being with us today and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thank it's you. a pleasure to get a chance to talk.